there are two kinds of infusions that are used. Um, in the United States, almost all of our pumps are drip pumps, where you spike it and it goes into a drip. In most other countries, syringe pumps, particularly for propofol, are much more common. He's going to draw this, just as I drew the propofol up for you, and then the syringe is placed in the pump, and the pump pushes the handle of the syringe in a controlled manner. Please continue. So you'll notice, he, just as I did, he first pulls air into the syringe. The air is then injected, and in multiple draws, just as I demonstrated earlier, he fills the syringe with, uh, with propofol. And, and it takes a few moments just because, you know, you have to go through this process. Okay, he then attaches this to the infusion tubing. If you could please stop. This is special tubing because it's what is called narrow tubing. The importance of being narrow tubing is, is that there is, the tubing is so thin that there is probably less than one milliliter, one cc of propofol in the entire tube. Why, why is that important? That's important because that way any change in the infusion rate is instantly seen by the patient as a change in the tubing. Tubing that is quite wide can have problems because it can expand and contract. And if you push on it, the tubing actually has what we call compliance. And so there's a delay, potentially, in transmitting a change in rate. So for syringe pumps, we use this narrow tubing so that there's precise control of the drug that the patient is seeing. Please continue. So he attaches it to the tubing. And then he has to push all of the air out of the tubing. That takes a few moments. So this is not a, a trivial task. He first moves the air to the top of the syringe. And then, over the next moment, uh, he's, <laughs> he's struggling to get the cap off. That one was glued on. <laughs> not really. Uh, he then pushes the, the, stop. He then pushed the air all the way through so that the tubing was only filled with propofol. Now he has the, the syringe, he has the tubing, now he has to put it into the pump itself. So, and then load it into the infusion pump, if you may continue. So this is a syringe pump. As you see the pump, that piece that's moving back is what is going to push the syringe forward in just a few moments. The syringe is, is placed into the pump, it is locked into place, shown here so that it can't move. And then the tubing is, is brought forward. Now he's going to program the pump. And so he goes down here and he's going to select the kind of drug he needs. I can see the word analgesic, like that's what he's going to use. He moves past cardiac, past other two hypnotic. Propofol is considered a hypnotic, so that is selected. Midazolam is the first choice, but that's not what he's going to use. He moves down instead to what is called propofol OR, OR meaning operating room. So this is the propofol operating room. He now enters the weight of the patient. So this uh, is done through this, this keyboard. Again, this takes time and care to do this correctly. He's entered the patient being 70 kilograms. And now he sets the initial infusion rate. Uh, it currently says, well, he's in the process of setting it. And after he sets this, he goes through and verifies all the setting. It looks, uh, he verifies the concentration of propofol at 10 mics per mil, and he's still working on the infusion rate. Okay, stop. You do all of this in the operating room to get everything ready, and then you go see the patient. Now, sometimes you might see the patient very early in the morning and then do all of this and then go back. But quite commonly, you get your room set up so everything's ready to go, and then you assess the patient. Either way, the point is you assess the patient. The anesthesiologist always interviews the patient. 
even if the anesthesiologist has seen this patient many times before, the anesthesiologist will say, you know, Mr. Jones, tell me, how are you today? What, what's happened since I last saw you? What are the changes? Because the anesthesiologist is responsible for knowing everything that is going on in his or her patient. The anesthesiologist also performs a quick physical examination. Not surprisingly, the most important thing again is the airway. Is there any suggestion that there's going to be any difficulty during this procedure in moving air in and out of the lungs? The anesthesiologist will also listen to the heart, also listen to the lungs, particularly if the patient is elderly or has reasons for you to think there might be either heart disease or lung disease. For example, if the patient has asthma, you'll want to see how their lungs are. This is done always before each procedure for every patient. There are no exceptions. Please continue. Following that, you obtain informed consent. Informed consent, you can stop for just a moment. Informed consent is one of those words that has several meanings. Some people think it's the document, the thing that the person signs. And it is that. That's called the informed consent. But informed consent is also a process. It's a process in which the physician, the anesthesiologist, the surgeon, the internist, the doctor in the emergency room, every physician has a responsibility to describe to the patient the risks of the procedure. That process is called the informed consent. Every physician is responsible for describing to patients foreseeable risks of the procedure. That is part of the process of the informed consent. Every physician is responsible for providing patients alternatives to the proposed procedure. That word alternatives is explicitly mentioned in written informed consents. That is part of the process. And finally, every physician is responsible for obviously clearly explaining what they're going to do. Here's the plan. And seeing that the patient's questions are answered. All of these are part of the process of informed consent. So it's not just a piece of paper. It's a process by which the physician presents the plan, the risks, the alternatives, and allows the patient to have their questions answered as well. So please continue. Dr. Hung explains the risks and the benefits and the alternatives uh, to the patient, actually a family friend of theirs, and then says, do you have any questions? And the patient says no. So at this point, the patient signs the informed consent. Please stop. Informed consents are signed pieces of paper. They're signed because throughout the patient's hospitalization, one checks before everything. Is there a signed informed consent? Because that documents not just the piece of paper, but that the process was followed. It documents that the process was followed for that patient. So a verbal informed consent is not binding. It happens occasionally in an operation where something might be discovered. And the, the surgeon say, well, we talked about it beforehand. And then the surgeon will always say, ah, it's not on the written informed consent. The fact that the surgeon discussed something beforehand, if it's not on the written informed consent, they cannot proceed uh, unless it's some sort of, of life-threatening emergency. So verbal informed consent is not recognized. It doesn't exist. Informed consent must be written. As you can see here, while this patient is signing it. Please continue. OK, please stop. In the interest of, of not having too much video here, what I have done is I have provided, I, I want to just take a moment to say, following that, the patient's brought into the operating room. Monitors are placed, the blood pressure cuff, pulse oximetry probe, electrocardiogram, the standard monitors are placed on the patient. The patient is given oxygen by nasal cannula. The intravenous catheter to give the saline is started in the patient's arm. 
And then we have something called an anesthesia pause. What is that? What is that? The anesthesia pause is another opportunity to be sure that everybody is on the same page. You verify the patient with two types of identification, typically date of birth and medical record number. You verify the procedure that you're going to do. Everybody who is involved in the procedure has all of their questions answered. The patient has not yet received anesthesia, so the patient is participating in this. And you're saying, you know, Mr. Jones, this is your understanding of what we're doing. Yes, one last check in the interest of the safety and well-being of the patient. Okay, at this point, that's all going to be skipped, and we're now going to see the patient on the uh, procedure table. So, first I'll stop. The pulse oximeter, <laughs> the pulse oximeter went by quickly, but it's just a little probe on the finger. That little white wire that you can see running here uh, that's, that, thank you. that's the pulse oximeter on the finger. And here's the white wire running back to the monitors. Please continue. And then I'm just sort of taking some, showing a couple other things here. This is the infusion pump that's all set up to the patient and ready to go. The emergency airway equipment is back here on the cart. It, you can see how close it is to the patient. It's right here organized and ready to use. Please continue. And you can see the patient has the nasal cannula in place right here. That's so that the patient is receiving additional oxygen and providing carbon dioxide monitoring. Stop. The anesthesiologist is in close communication with the patient. You will feel sleepy very soon. And with that, please continue. The infusion pump is started, shown here. So now propofol is being administered to the patient. Stop. You'll notice that Professor Hung is sitting right next to the patient. The anesthesiologist is in close proximity to the patient. How close? You, you can reach out and touch the patient throughout the case. In this case, he's tapping the patient's shoulder to see if the patient is feeling the effects of propofol. Are you feeling sleepy yet? So the anesthesiologist has this moment-by-moment -moment connection to the patient constantly throughout the procedure. Please continue. So the patient seems to be pretty sleepy here. You'll notice here, stop. This is a chart. The anesthesiologist writes down everything that happens as diligently as you are doing here. <laughs> the anesthesiologist is recording all of the blood pressures Every five minutes, the pulse oximetry, the carbon dioxide, the rate that the patient is breathing gets recorded usually every 15 minutes, the heart rate, the heart rhythm, what does the EKG look like, is being recorded. So all of the drugs are being recorded. This record is not just some static document that gets put in a chart somewhere. It's part of the therapy. You can use it as you're providing this, the therapy, the anesthesia. You use it to see what happened 10 minutes ago. What was the blood pressure 10 minutes ago? So you can see if it's going up or going down. You use it to keep track of your drugs. When did I give that last dose of something? Ah, here's when I gave it. It is integral to your care of the patient. And if anything ever goes wrong, it's integral so that you and the patient can learn what happened so that the mistake doesn't get repeated next time, or the complication does not happen next time. Or when the patient is seen by another doctor, the patient can say, here's my medical record, and there was a problem, and the other doctor can know what happened. Keeping this is not a convenience. Keeping this is a fundamental responsibility to the patient. It's also fundamental to the care that is being given. Please continue. So here, Dr. Hung is going to observe the breathing. You have to watch very closely because the diaphragm actually is not moving very much when people are